It was the year of the Queen's Silver Jubilee, but in Pontreed event, people were out welcoming their own royalty as Richard Burton returned home to see the family. Vincent Kane was on hand to talk to him for BBC Wales. So now on 2W, let's look back at Wales yesterday. Richard Burton recently paid a visit to his home village in South Wales with his new wife Susie. In Pondry de Ven, Richard is a hero. He returns frequently because he's a member of a large family. Large the programme came on Friday was a current affairs programme, a weekly one, week in, week out. And he works hard to maintain. Burton arrived and agreed with the editor that he'd do it that day if we did it down there in the village near Port Talbot. So I was told at no notice whatsoever Get yourself down there because we're going to do Burton. Mr. Vincent, hello. Oh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I woke you up this morning very early and spoke to you on the radio. What time was it? Oh, it was about 10 to 8, if you remember. I ah, that was the late. Radio. There was somebody at me at half past five. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought on the way to talk to him that Burton was a modern Faustus. You know the Faustus story. He sold his soul to the devil for 20 years of health, wealth, and Helen of Troy. Well, 20 years earlier, Burton on the threshold of a great career and sold his soul to the devil for 20 years of Hollywood and millions of dollars and Elizabeth Taylor. And now after 20 years, I was the devil coming to claim his soul. He's off the bottle these days, but the local pub seemed the ideal venue. I realized that Richard was highly intelligent. His intelligence was stronger than his vanity. And usually it's the other way around with film stars. Because of the nature of my uh, life that I've become a, a gypsy. The viewers, I think, will see that behind that ravaged face and that tired, cynical smile, a mind, a sober mind, was racing. And I think that he was coming to accept that much of his life had been a waste. If you'd concentrated on the stage, we might have had a, a magnificent uh, Olivia-type actor. Yes, well, I don't know if I want to be a magnificent Olivia-type actor. I interviewed quite a few Welsh showbiz personalities in my long career. Burton was the only one where I came away thinking more of the person than when I went to meet them. Richard, you've always said that you get a tremendous kick out of coming back to Wales. Is that still true? Oh, yes, indeed, yes. Very evocative sometimes. It takes me several days to recover after I've left because, uh, peculiarly, uh, my particular village, Ponte de Ven, though I have a sister village too, which is Taibach, but Taibach has been radically changed by all these new roads and everything. But Ponte de Ven, apart from uh, knocking down a few houses and the erection of about three or four others, is stick for stick and stone for stone. Blade of grass for blade of grass, virtually the same exactly as it was when I was a child. And I went to the school, for instance, this morning, and that seems to me to be exactly the same. Same old scuffed stones and kicked cobbles. And, uh, you know, James Joyce once, once wrote in a belle lettre or something, I read it when I was quite young, about 14 or 15, that, that every man was searching for the place he belongs to. And I always had that particular line of James Joyce's in the back of my head. I thought if I suddenly one day see a place which I recognize as almost uh, immanently, not the other word, belonging to me, and I didn't find any place particular that struck me as this is the place where I belong to, until perhaps about 20 years later, and I disguised myself heavily to go to the village because if you think I'm recognizable in England or the United States or India or somewhere, uh, naturally I'm infinitely more recognizable here because they all know the family face apart from mine. But if I put a bowler hat on, my face becomes completely distorted. First of all, it turns absolutely round. I look like an absolute idiot. So I went up by bus to Ponte de Ven. 
And as we turned round, around the lip of the mountain, and suddenly there it's pondered, and I thought, well, by God, James Joyce was right. There is one place you do belong to, and it is, in my case, the place where I came from, which is Ponte de Vene. There's a tradition here in Wales that, um, that you owe a debt, an immeasurable debt, to the, the man that taught you here, the man that taught you your craft, Philip Burton. Yes, indeed I do. But uh, I think the, the four people, really, to, to whom I owe uh, an enormous amount were... There was a schoolteacher in the elementary school, who was called Meredith Jones, who was lamentably dead, and um, he first opened my mind to the extraordinary uh, width, beauty, depth, colour of the English language, though he was a Welsh-speaking Welshman like myself. And the second, of course, was Phil Burton, who gave me the background of a classical education. Uh, the third was Emlyn Williams, who gave me my first part on the stage and on screen. And the fourth was John Gielgud, who taught me to speak verse by osmosis, as to her, not directly, but I worked in plays with him and he directed me in plays. So those have been the most profound influences on my uh, dramatic career, anyway. There's another tradition, you see, a dramatic tradition, Richard, which is that, uh, that you've still not, in a sense, realised the full potential, the full dramatic potential, which Phil Burton and perhaps one or two of the others who you've mentioned saw in the young Richard. Yes, well, it's a rather nice reputation to have because, um, for instance, I just did a play in New York, Equus, and it was an enormous success. And one of the critics said that um, their number one critic, very acid, very acerbic gentleman who writes for the New York Times, uh, and he gave me a splendid notice, uh, but among other things he said that Richard Burton is unquestionably the most brilliantly promising middle-aged actor now alive. And I, uh, my friends thought that that perhaps was um, a little insulting, but I didn't at all. I thought it's very nice to be still promising at 51. By 51, most actors have already played every part they can play and have um, become desiccated and dried up. No, actually, I think that my whole life, uh, my whole life, of course, is not acting. It's not a vocation with me as it is with most, uh, almost all my contemporaries. Like if you talk to Laurence Olivier, who's not a contemporary, of course, he's the other generation. But the younger ones, like Peter O'Toole or Albert Finney, or Paul Schofield, uh, Marlon Brando, those people, they were actors, as to were, from the womb. Whereas I became an actor by accident. And I've never really taken it as seriously as they have, though I've worked at it very hard. It is a very hard job and probably the best job I could have found for my particular kind of temperament. But it would seem to me that all the vicissitudes and uh, torments and tortures and all life's uh, tiny, small tragedies which are now deeply etched into my face have been a preparation for the 50s because now with my enormous experience as an actor both on the stage and the screen and I've played almost every major role in the theatrical canon that you can play at my age. I've played Hamlet, I've played Henry V, I've played Coriolanus, I've played Iago, I've played Othello, I've played Shaw, I've played Chekhov, I've played virtually everybody, and of course a lot of films too, that I'm now ready to tackle the final ones, King Lear. I am going to avoid Macbeth because uh, I think that he's dominated by Lady Macbeth too much, and uh, and I don't like the idea of being dominated by a woman. So uh, I shall withdraw from Macbeth, but I probably will play Lear. And as you know, with Lear, which is the most demanding part in the whole uh, vast canon of theatrical uh, great plays, that is probably the most demanding of all. And you've Do you got feel to be... any affinity with Falstaff, then, if you say you don't with... with oh, Macbeth? yes, yes. Falstaff, I think, uh, was written with my father in mind. You know, a marvellous man in the taproom, a uh, great uh, drinker, and rather fancied uh, the opposite sex. It might have been written for me, come to think of it. And um, anyway, I think he's probably the greatest comic invention, with the possible exception of Don Quixote in uh, literature, and I long to play him. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to look fat enough, but 
we'll figure that out somehow. The question about promise, you see, in a way, another way of phrasing the question is, is it true, as some, uh, some of your critics have said, that the screen has really been an irrelevance in your life, that if you'd concentrated on the stage, we might have had a, a magnificent uh, Olivia-type actor? Yes, well, I don't know if I want to be a magnificent Olivia type actor, you know, he's, uh, uh, Larry, of course, is a stupendous actor, and so are half a dozen of his, his contemporaries, uh, Sir John Gilgood, Sir Alec Guinness, Sir Ralph Richardson, and so on, but by damn, they've had to work very hard, and, uh, the demands on a stage actor especially in repertory where you do six plays or five or six plays at the same time are enormous and also enormously difficult to to make any money at it i mean any real money especially with the world in its present state so ideally i did i'm afraid for about 10 years i went through a sort of uh, i can only describe it as some sort of male menopause and i didn't really care what i did i drank very heavily and uh, did any film uh, that came along. Always been very careful about plays, though. I don't do any rubbishy plays, and uh, indeed I've only had one failure in a stage play. I've had many in films, but then it's very difficult to know what's going to happen between the cup and the lip in the films. But uh, I suppose I made about ten memorable films, uh, and I've done a few reasonably good performances on the stage, but I did neglect the stage for about 10 years. For instance, my last appearance in New York, um, in Equus, it was 10 years since I'd been on the stage also in New York in, in Hamlet, which I played there for a long time. And I think too that the British critics and general theatrical journalists, if you don't play on, on the stage in England, it seems that you haven't played. I mean, doesn't, Broadway doesn't matter, you see, unless you've played in the West End or at the Old Vic. So I, I suppose in order to show them that I actually have been on the stage in the last 15 years since I left England and went to live in Switzerland, I shall uh, do the next play probably at the Old Vic, uh, not the National Theatre, because I don't think I can afford the time to stay that long at the National Theatre, so probably play at the Old Vic, uh, possibly with Glenda Jackson and uh, Peter Firth, that was obviously going to become a big international star, and then take it to New York, if it's successful in Britain, and then do a couple of films and try to keep that going until finally I drop dead, <laughs> either exhaustion or boredom. You mentioned money, uh, and real money was the phrase you used now. You've made a lot of it, Richard, but has it been a driving force in your life? Has it been a top no. priority? No, it's never been of any particular... I was one of those uh, people, I think, who was born without any problem about money. I'm not suggesting that I was born rich. I certainly wasn't. We, I was born uh, during and grew up during the Depression, and certainly there wasn't too much money around, but I never seemed to lack for it. Uh, the odd thruppence in the pocket and immediately I became an actor and I virtually had a little more than a walk-on part with John Gielgud in the ladies not for burning in whenever it was 1949 um, I was one of those strange things which happens every decade or so I was a star overnight so I've never had to worry about money in that sense but because of the enormous taxation especially in Britain you can earn. I remember once when I was a baby, about 23 or 24, I remember earning in one year, you can remember the figures exactly, as a matter of fact, 68,000 pounds, which in those days, of course, was considerably more than it is now, and I paid 61,000 pounds in tax. I thought, now there's something wrong there, isn't there? And of course, I wouldn't cheat on income tax. I'm te too terrified to do that. So I thought, I've got to do something about this. But I kept, still kept working in England and the United States and paying British taxes. And then one day I discovered, having earned by this time a couple of million, I suppose, I had a Jaguar car. I had about 6,000 pounds in the bank. And I had a two-roomed, rather nice two-roomed flat in Hampstead. And uh, 
I thought, what happens if nobody wants me anymore? I lose whatever trick it is that attracts the public. I'm uh, going to be in trouble, which is why I moved to Switzerland and then concentrated for quite a time on films until I became rich enough not to worry anymore. And you don't worry anymore? No, no, no. I, I suppose I could retire now and live with relative ease for um, the rest of my life. Also, I was, I was made a, a fellow of St. Peter's College, Oxford. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but they do guarantee me bed and breakfast for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and it's never crossed my mind that, uh, for instance, if there was some sort of financial or other kind of cataclysm tomorrow, which would wipe out everything I have, I'm perfectly convinced I can make it all again in six months or a year. Even if I wasn't wanted as an actor, somehow or other, I have this capacity for attracting wealth, property, etc. Have you ever asked yourself why that is? Have you ever stood back and looked at your own talent or your own uh, ability inside the profession and wondered what it is that made Burton an instant success and what it is that assures Burton that if he had to start again, he'd do well again? Well, yes, obviously, uh, because I don't understand. Actually, it gives me a slightly eerie feeling sometimes, especially in the middle of the night when one is uh, no longer an atheist. You know, I'm a daylight atheist. In the middle of the night, I sometimes, when I'm troubled, and I reach out for the slim, cool comfort of a cigarette after a nightmare or something, I begin to wonder if there's something rather strange up there. But that's a very common Celtic phenomenon, I'm sure. But uh, it has uh, puzzled me that I know at least, shall we say, over the years, about 20 actors who are every bit as accomplished as I am. And uh, for the most part, I may say, far better looking. And the same size and weight and shape with all the accoutrements of what one would think a star for lack of a better word, should have good voice, good presence, good eyes. And they haven't made it. And it always raises the long gone atavistic short hairs on the back of my uh, vertebrae. And I can never quite figure it out. And I can only assume it's some sort of diabolical or even divine luck. But I wouldn't claim to have priority on it. It happens to. About, there are about 20 or 30 people like that in the world, and they don't know, but they worry about it, because I know most of them very well, but I never worry about it. But I do sometimes wonder about it. I'm not at all, I hope you, I, I don't get the impression of smugness, so I'm not at all smug about it. I suppose it's some sort of thing that comes from the family, from my family background, that despite the relative poverty. I call it relative poverty now because since I grew up I've been to really poor places and I suddenly realized that we grew up like kings compared, shall we say, to the people who lived in the slums of Naples or in southern Spain or in some parts of Africa I've been to and South America. We lived uh, like lords compared with that. But um, despite that I've never had that feeling of insecurity about money. And yet I met immensely wealthy people, born wealthy, I mean, with, uh, and I don't mean my kind of wealth, but real wealth, 200 million, 400 million, who are really terrified of losing money, losing their money. Can we talk about, for a moment, about the, um, the Burton style, uh, the, the uh, sensational, robustious, sometimes scandalous style of life which, uh, which you adopted, or which you appear to have adopted in the last yes. 10 or 20 years. Is this, uh, is this something deliberate? Have you always courted that sort of publicity, or has it just come? No, I think it was a natural instinct, I think. I don't know quite what happened, but um, when I first made a, a big success on the stage, I don't mean when I played the first part with Gielgud, which elevated me into, in inverted commas, uh, stardom, uh, but uh, when I first played Shakespeare, that's when it really hit the jackpot. For some reason, though other actors of roughly the same age were more or less having the same impact, mine was front page for some reason. I've never discovered quite why, whereas theirs was on page four. And that particular kind of 
colourful, for lack of a better word, pub publicity has followed me around. Of course, I also have lived very dangerously, and I've, uh, by, I'm, by normal standards, I should be a dead man. I, I've uh, drunk more than uh, most uh, men would do in several thousand lifetimes. I may say I haven't had a drink now for it. I can't believe that I've been in Wales for 36 hours and I haven't had a drink yet. This, by the way, in case my sister <laughs> is looking, is water. And um, anyway, I find it rather interesting to give up drink completely, which I have done, and uh, discovered, for instance, that for about five years, um, I didn't quite remember what films I'd done or anything. And I ran into a chap after I'd become a good boy and sobered up. I saw a very distinguished actor at a party, and I went over and I said, I've admired you for so many years, I'm so glad to meet you. And he was an American, and he said, Kid, we did a film together. It lasted four months. And I said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> you were talking, Richard, about the, um, about the rumbustious quality of the life you've led. And uh, the, the question I had asked was whether you courted the sort of publicity you've got or whether it dogged you. Well, um, I realized it was a very important part of the business and was always very accommodating with the press. I didn't seek them out. They sought me out, but I didn't turn them away. And there was a way, of course, of acquiring publicity, I presume. I'm thinking uh, absolutely out of the top of my head. I've never really thought about it before. By not giving, like, the Greta Garbo type of publicity, which is to withdraw, as somebody once said famously, into the limelight. <laughs> uh, mine has been the opposite. If you wanted to see me, I'd talk. And it is, uh, I suppose, um, psychologically, possibly, subconsciously anyway, in the back of my mind, I've always known when to make an explosion of some kind and make sure it's done in public so that the world knows about it. Have you resented the, um, the publicity which you're a much married man, Richard, which your marital affairs have always attracted? Or... I've only been married four times and twice to the <laughs> same woman, so that's only three times really, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I have friends who are up and they're, they're in double figures. Right. Uh, but, uh, oh, no, I was married to my first wife for 13 years and I was married to my second wife for 13 years and uh, I've been married to my third wife for about 13 weeks so and she's much younger so that last 13 years that'll take us to when 1889 won't it something like that yeah. the moral is you don't like living alone <laughs> <laughs> yes no, I love women all shapes sizes ages uh, as a matter of fact you should have seen me sweep through my village this morning I kissed women from the age of 92 to uh, eight and I think I got down to one who was three and a half so I'm absolutely, uh, totally without prejudice about women. I really love their company. I love being with them. And uh, the trouble is, they appear to love yours as well. Uh, some of them do. Yes, <laughs> can't think why. Maybe because I talk a lot. You don't have a family of your own, Richard. Um, you don't have. You don't have children. You don't have son anyway, do you? I don't have a son. I have two daughters from my first wife. And, of course, uh, an adopted daughter that I adopted with Elizabeth uh, when the baby was nine months old. She's 15 now. And Liza, who's also Elizabeth's daughter, was approximately three years old when I became, as to her father, so I consider her my daughter and she oh. considers me her father. So, in actual fact, I've got four children. The two boys also, of course, uh, Elizabeth's two eldest boys, I'm very fond of and they of me and they indeed come around to see me all the time as they did last week before I came down here to Dorchester. Uh, but they were already seven and nine years old so you don't have quite and also their father is still alive so you, uh, and they adore him so I don't have quite the same sort of paternal love for them, enormous affection as I do for the girls. And you're not done yet are you Richard? Not done yet you see now Susan is very tall She's English, too, you see, with a touch of Scottish blood. So that gives a nice little uh, Celtic sort of uh, tinge to it all. And she's five feet ten, and I'm five feet ten and a half. And if we can get the length to go into her and my breadth and produce a boy, he's almost certain to be number eight for Wales. <laughs> 
I was told, uh, I was told that I was allowed one question, provided it wasn't a rude one, Richard, about, <laughs> uh, about Elizabeth. So let's see if I can phrase it. The, uh, the Richard Burton-Elizabeth Taylor relationship of the 60s, will that, you think, be the, one of the, the dominant events of your life when, when, when the time comes? Oh, the yes, yes, yes. It was, a, it was a tremendous fun, and uh, I adored and adore Elizabeth. We just find find it impossible to live together uh, because our temperaments are both very high and very explosive and uh, I suppose you know 13 years of such intensity with two people living together who adored each other as, as much as we did uh, it's it's at such a continual seething boiling point that eventually it spills over but uh, there is no rancor, no animosity on either side. And she seems to be very content with her present husband, who couldn't be more opposite from me than he is. He's a lawyer and he smokes a pipe and he's a great gentleman and he's a, a, the, the American equivalent of an English squire. And perhaps that's uh, uh, the best thing I could have done for Elizabeth is to <laughs> allow her a little peace from my uh, quite demanding personalities sometimes sometimes of course I'm a little angel well in the course of the program Richard you told me that you've uh, you, you've got past the male menopause safely that you've got all the money we hope, we hope. You, all, all the money that you need you've got a new wife with I'm not terribly rich mind you but I've got enough you've got a new wife with whom you're very happy you've got the the, the drink problem buttoned up you can handle it what more does life uh, offer you what what more do you want from it now I think I Ideally, but again, this might be a pipe dream. Um, I'd like to, perhaps in five or six years, become um, a cameo player, if, if you know what I mean. Let everybody else do the work and have a very splendid part, lasting about 20 minutes, in which you walk away <laughs> for the entire show <laughs> and get to the theatre uh, late and go home early or to the film studio uh, early and go home early and uh, occasionally write. I, I feel as if there's a great deal particularly about my family that I should write because it is a remarkable family. Um, each one of my brothers I think is just as talented as I am but never went the same in the same direction as I did, particularly one or two of them. And uh, I'd like to write about my father, my mother and my ancestors and I think it's the pull of this place, the physical pull of Ponty de Ven and uh, not to be forgotten, Tai Bach, which also is, uh, gives me a great, uh, a great uh, turns my stomach to warm water, this kind of, this whole ambience, the faces, the people, the accents, the language too, of course. Well, Mr. Burton, you're very welcome on this programme, just as you're very welcome every time you come back to Wales. Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. Thank you.